Hey, everybody, this is Sean Kennedy. Thanks for tuning in and participating by filling out the form and asking questions for my guest, Eddie Luisi, who is the stage manager for Good Morning America. We have students checking in from Pennsylvania, Alaska, Texas, New Jersey, Connecticut, and maybe even some more that I've forgotten about. Now we are. So, hey, everyone, thanks for tuning in today. I am thrilled that so many people uh, across the country have participated in this. And I'm uh, equally thrilled that my good friend Eddie Luisi has agreed to take some time out of his schedule uh, to come in and talk to everyone. So, Eddie, thanks for coming. You're welcome. How are you doing, Sean? I'm doing all right, man. Awesome. Um, the wonders of social media. Uh, we worked together a few years ago, a couple times on Good Morning America. Uh, yeah. But because of social media, we've been able to stay close and in contact, which is pretty amazing. Yes, it, it's been wonderful. I love our friendship. Yep. Uh, so what I want to do is, uh, before we get into the questions that the kids and some of the teachers actually asked, I want to give a shout out to some of the school districts and uh, some of the states that are uh, participating in this. So I'm in the outskirts of Philly. I'm in the uh, suburbs of Philly. And uh, my students are all at the Upper Dublin School District and Sandy Run Middle School. So we have a bunch of questions from them. Um, we have friends from the Abington School District, Colonial School District, Lower Moreland School District, um let's see where else upper moreland school district we're all pretty close to each other and then as we go a little further west in pa out towards lancaster we have a uh, school district Ephrata school district so thanks to all the kids and teachers that are participating from Ephrata. uh go a little north up near allentown area out near kutztown we have brandywine heights high school checking in um and we have um a school in texas and alaska checking in too alaska so, woo Right. So hi to everyone across the uh, country that's participating in this, and we hope it's uh, educational and maybe even entertaining. I don't know. Let's see what happens. Um, we'll, we'll try. <laughs> <laughs> if you play so, some drums, it will be entertaining. Yeah, that's right. If we if we get stuck, I'll just start making some noise back here. Okay. All right. So, Eddie, uh, the way we'll do this is I have a, a spreadsheet of questions, and I've kind of highlighted a bunch of things. Um, I'm going to Give a shout out to some of the kids. If I don't mention all of you, I apologize. Because uh, some of the questions, of course, there's a common theme with a bunch of the questions. So if I can give you a shout out, kids, I will. And uh, so here we go, Eddie. Uh, our first question is from a student out there named Maisie. And she wants to know, how did you get your job at Good Morning America? Okay, Maisie. How you doing? Are you Pennsylvania or are you Alaska? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> So it's a really, really long story. So I could talk, how long is this class? Five hour class? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Maybe we'll do the uh, truncated version today. <laughs> uh, basically, I went to Hunter College in New York City. I had several internships in television. And eventually, after working at Channel 11 WPX TV, I started freelancing and I started going at ABC doing a bunch of soap operas. You guys probably don't know what soap operas are, but they've been around a long time. Maybe some of the parents or teachers remember that. Right. Then I, I did Good Morning America one day, right? Everybody knows I work Good Morning America, right? So I did it on January 1st, New Year's Day, because nobody wanted to wake up early after partying all night long. So I worked the show. There's two stage managers on the show. And... I never saw the show at all. I went in there kind of cold or green, however you want to say that. And then the other stage manager was a woman. She only did the show like two times. So she didn't really know it well. So I have headsets, right? I have headsets with a microphone. I talk to listen to the director. For two hours, I got yelled at on headsets because I was doing everything wrong. And I was making all these mistakes. So the show's finished. I go home. I don't get called for 11 months. 11 months later, I get called to do the show again. This time I do it with the main stage manager. So he kind of holds my hand and tells me where to go. I do a good job. I become the number one backup on the show, right? And this is over 30 something years ago. A month or so later, I go up to the director and I say, hey, Don, I said, do me a favor. Tell me why, you know, I did the show. You yelled at me for two hours. I don't get called for 11 months. Like, what was up with that? He said, Ed, well, let me, let me tell you. It took, he took 11 months to fire all the freelance and you were next on the pile. So that's how you got the gig. So I wow. said, oh, interesting. And the director at the time, Don Roy King, 
Right now, he's the Emmy Award director for Saturday Night Live. He's been doing Saturday Night, Night Live for years. And um, so that's my buddy. So I have a follow-up question based on your answer. Um, I'm, of course, a musician, and I know the musician, uh, the world of musicians is very small. Uh, if you stay in it long enough, all of a sudden you get to know a lot of the same people. Is television the same way? Pretty much. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, in TV, I guess it's a little different than you guys, but, we, you know, we have news and we have sports and we have entertainment and we have late night and early morning and this and that. But after a while, if you're around for a long time and, and you're a good person and you're talented and you, and you make connections, yeah, you know, there, there's, a, there's a group of us that know each other, sure. Excellent, excellent. Let's see. Um, let me see. And I like to always hand out cards. I have business cards all the time. You oh, know? nice. So it's like whenever I meet somebody, if there's a connection, I'm always handing out a card. And you and you guys are all younger and, and you know, you don't have cards and stuff. But, you know, when you meet somebody that's a, a good contact, a good person you want to stay in contact with, you give you give your contact info and you always reply. You always if somebody this is professional advice. These are mainly eighth graders or any high school. Uh, no, we got uh, we could probably have seventh through twelfth grade. OK, so we have a bunch of high school also. Yep. yep. So professionally okay because you know i'm a professional sean's a professional when somebody professionally contacts you you contact them as soon as possible if you could do it within the hour you do if you could do it within you know you have to do it within 24 hours if you're really really busy you text them you email them say look i got your message i'll get back to you in in more detail when i get a chance but that's the professional thing to do Always be available for, for people. Um, I'll let you ask a few questions, but then I could give like a little type of career oh, yeah. motivation talk also. Great. Yeah, because that a lot of the questions are geared that way. But um, just to dovetail off of your respond thing, that's so important. I've sent emails to people and uh, it's just been radio silence. And after two or three days, you're like, I don't want to work with that person. Because right. they never had the, you know, the respect to just get back to me and say, hey, I'm busy. You know, what, one quick thing. Hey, I'm busy. I'll get back to you soon. That would be enough and it'd be OK. Um, and, and, and you know this and I know this also, especially if you're a freelance musician or a freelance television person. If somebody calls you, texts you for a gig, for a job, the answer is yes, 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 yes. At this stage of your life, at this stage of your career, you know, Seniors in high school, college, out in the job, you say yes. Because if I say, hey, look, I got a gig Friday night at 8 o'clock, I need you, and you say no, that's it. You're done. You're out of my radar. I go to somebody else. If that person says yes and they do a good job, who do you think I'm going to call the next time I have a gig? I'm going to call the person that said yes. Now, I'm not saying that you're done for the rest of your life, you know, but in my eyes, if I give you an opportunity and you say no, I'm sorry, I'm moving on to someone else. You say yes, you do a good job. I'm sticking with you and your friends and, and your community and your tribe and your, you know. Yeah, and when I, I, I run into that stuff a lot too. And especially in my younger days, I made a habit of if someone said, listen, I have a gig for you. Um, even if I couldn't do it, my response was so helpful. I'm like, I'm so sorry. I can't help you out this Friday, but here's three other guys yep. Or, yep. that I think are really good. Yep. And that contact, it, it's it's happened almost every time. Even though I didn't do the gig, they called me first again because I was Correct. so helpful finding them someone instead of being hey, like, oh, I can't do it. How do you know my story? That's that's what I oh, do. It is? Alexa. Come on, man. You're stealing from me. Sorry. All right. All right. Less for me. Less for me. All right. But isn't that cool that you're a music person that works TV on the side? I'm a TV person that does music. But, you know, it, it's the yeah. same worlds and it's the same right. thing with connections and, and treating people respectfully and honest and, and professionally. Exactly. That's all. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Just respect. And I think you'll everyone will be successful. All right. Let's get back to the kids questions. Okay. Uh, enough of us talking. Let's see. Um, all right. Let me see. OK, this is interesting. This is a question from a student named Ella. Um, she wants to know on Good Morning America. Is everything that the hosts say uh, scripted on a teleprompter or are they free to comment? Good question, Ella. I have a daughter, Ella. So hello, Ella. Um, both. So normally, Good Morning America is a two-hour show from seven to nine. 
Each half hour, we have a new opening. So each open, the 7 o'clock, the 7.30, the 8, the 8.30 is scripted. And they have teleprompter. Um, so they pretty much read what's scripted. If there's a little line or a little something they want to change, they can. But then after they read the prompter, then since there's two or three hosts, they turn to each other and they kind of ad lib and they talk about, you know, what happened yesterday, what happened, this and that. So there's a mixture of ad libbing and prompter. George Stephanopoulos, if you watch our show, who's a you know very famous uh, person, not only in TV, but he was in politics also. When he's doing an interview, he turns the prompter off. He asks the prompter operator to go to black. So when he looks straight ahead, he doesn't see any words, not even the intro. It's all here. He knows exactly what he's going to say, right? So just like as musicians, right, it's, it's good sometimes not to have music. You listen with your ears and, and you kind of can improvise. I know so many high school kids and college kids that are musicians, but I'm also a church musician. And they could sight read better than me. And they're in the pit bands and they do this and they do that, which I can't do. But at church, you know, I give them a few chords and I say, okay, on the violin or the flute, piano, just kind of rock out, just jam. And they can't because they don't know how to. So it's always good to be able to improvise in TV and music. Yeah, it's a, it's a balancing act. If you can do both, I think you'll be more successful. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. Okay, this is another one from Ella. I thought this was a very good question. All right, Ella. Yeah, Ella is coming in with the great questions. It says, how do the cameramen switch um, cameras? Uh, she wants to know if they're making the decision to switch cameras, if they have like three cameras on a, a shot or something, yep. or just how does that happen? Good question, Ella. Um, I have a 20-year-old daughter, Olivia, who goes to Emerson College, and she's studying writing for film and television. And she would say, they're not cameramen, they're camera people. <laughs> Just want to let you know. So in this day and age, like the camera people, and we do have women that do camera also. And actually our director is a female director. Um, so we have on Good Morning America, we have 14 cameras. We have a downstairs studio and upstairs studio. We go outside, we go in the green room, we go in the dressing rooms. But basically each camera person, they have a viewfinder and, and they look, they look at their shot. The director directs them into what shots they're supposed to have. The director who's in a control room on another floor has a wall of monitors or TV sets and could see all 14 cameras plus all different videotapes and all different graphics and, and, and different things like that. That director calls each shot, take one, take four, take three, take two. Then there's another person called a TD or a technical director that sits in front of this big board and it has all these different buttons with lights. So when they say take one, take this, take that, they're pressing buttons. So the director's in charge, gives the direction to the TD and, and the camera people are, are, so it's all connected, but the director calls the shots. So anytime you watch TV, anytime you see a camera cut, that's the director calling that cut. Awesome. Cool. Very interesting. Uh, let's see. Who is this? Now, I'm getting $10 per question, right? So LL yes, is $20? Yes. Exactly. That's, that's yeah. true. So just give me your address. You know what? I could PayPal you. It might be. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, okay. Here's a good question. This is from one of our students named Gus. It says, how have you gotten better at stage managing since you started? Good question. Wow. Um, I think the way I get better is that I pay more attention. First of all, professionally, um, I look at beforehand when we have our meetings, I pay attention to the director and I write all these different notes. Then when we get changes, I'm always looking at my rundown, making the changes. So I know on my rundown, which is kind of like a lineup of the show, what we're doing, I know what I got to do. Then, then I get better by paying attention to the whole set. I look at every detail. I walk around. We have prop people that are supposed to clean up the floors and, and the desk and this and that. But I look at everything. When I'm actually giving my cues, I might be 40 feet from the entrance door where guests come in and where crew comes in. And I'm standing by a camera. But as the stage manager, I, I look at the whole set 360 degrees 
even while I'm working, I'm always aware. So some people might think, oh, you're not doing anything. You throw a cue and you're just standing there. But I see all 360 degrees and I see if people come in with script or somebody's doing this. One time we were doing a shot because not only are we in charge of cueing the talent or the people on camera, but we're shooting this way. And then behind me, we have a Steadicam camera that's shooting these two big walls with graphics. And one of the weather guys who was a freelancer was running in the shot. And I run from my camera position, grab him and pull him off so he doesn't get caught in the shot. Um, so paying attention, right? And, and being nice and courteous to people and respectful. Each person has their own job. And especially in network television, everyone's supposed to be professionals. You let them do their job. And obviously, if they have a question or you see they're not doing the right thing, I go over very nicely and I direct them and I help them out. Awesome. Great. Uh, let's see. Okay. Here's a very specific question from, let's see, this student's name is Kenzie. Kenzie. Okay. Uh, now, I gave the kids your bio and a bunch of the people you've worked with. So some of these questions, uh, the information was garnered from that information. So hopefully everything's accurate here. So oh, you um, did your homework. <laughs> yeah. You get um, an A. <laughs> <laughs> so Kenzie wants to know, what was it like working with Zac Efron and the cast of High School Musical 1 and 2? Woo! I love them. I have a bunch of old pictures. I got to find them and then send them to you. Um, they were absolutely wonderful. Um, when they were first on the set years and years ago, my, I have three daughters. They were all like tiny little kids. And my one girl had glasses with an eye patch. And so you see the set and my kids are like five feet away off to the side, dancing and having a good time. Very nice, very professional, um, down to earth, really great, great people. Also the choreographer, director, can't think of his name right now. Um, Kenny Ortega. Oh Yeah he came to the set and he would help choreograph and this and that and just all wonderful, talented, great kids. Um, the person that I see, who's the one who was in a jump in and dancing with the stars. He's on Broadway now. I can't think of his name. He was one of the basketball players with the big Afro. Oh, that Corbin blue Corbin blue. Yeah. So Corbin comes to the set often and he did dancing with the stars. He's, you know, he's a young man now and he's done Broadway, but, all these younger people, they kind of remember me. And I don't know if it's a father figure because I'm 60 years old or there's just respect or just my personality. But they all come and I get big hugs from all these people, from Demi Lovato and, and all these younger people, Selena Gomez. I, and there's just a certain attraction, there's a certain love that, that and respect that I give to them, they give to me. That's really great. That's great to hear. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Okay, that question was kind of answered. Let me just jump around here for a second. Um, okay. Um, now, Olivia asked a question about your college, but you answered that already. But I just wanted to give a shout out to Olivia because she was on top of that. Hunter okay. College, $786 a year. <laughs> oh, my gosh. My oh, daughter right. goes to Emerson, $60,000 plus. Right. How times have changed. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> Insane. I have, I, I have daughters in college too. And it's like, Oh my goodness. Yep. Um, all right. Here's a question from a student named Atticus. Um, it says, what is your favorite part of your job? Um, I have a lot of things that I like about my job, but if you want to go professionally, I like that it's live TV um, live to me. Live TV to me is fabulous because you have to do your job well and you do it. And if there's a mistake, either you do it or somebody else does it, you keep on going. I love that. Um, I've worked on a lot of tape shows, a lot of, a lot of shows with actors and music. And when there's mistakes, stop, do it again, reset, take one, take two, take 14. It gets real boring. Also our show is a two hour show, but, it has everything. It has news. It has music. It has fashion. It has, you know, different correspondents, authors, politicians. So our show is is kind of a lot of variety. So I enjoy the variety. I enjoy that it's live. And then all the people. I love all the people that I work with. Very good. Very good. And I get paid. Hey, that's a bonus, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. Okay, here is an interesting question. 
from uh, Dave. He's one of the teachers uh, at one of the schools here. So this is a teacher question. It says, if you could go back into middle school, uh, your middle school days, what is one piece of advice that you would give yourself? So I, I played guitar when I, when I was 12 years old. I started playing guitar. And from middle school to high school, even to college, I never had anybody mentor me and anybody actually tell me if I wanted to make this a career, how I should go. So I would tell myself that if you want to make music your career, learn to sight read. Because at the time, I thought, e even at the young age that I was in middle school and then getting older, I knew I wanted to be a family person. And I thought musicians work nights and weekends and are always on planes or, or buses and, and cars traveling all over. And no one taught me or mentored me that if I could sight read music and then I could ad lib, I could be a session player and I could be in a studio and I could work a nine to five gig and I could work on albums and movie tracks and TV tracks and commercials. And I would have enjoyed that a lot. And the interesting thing is, even though I don't as a musician work with a lot of professional musicians, as a stage manager, I have worked with all these top musicians. So I had a plan, God had another plan. I'm still working with pros. I'm just not the musician playing with them. I'm kind of in the background and I'm cueing them and I'm giving them kind of advice and direction, but I'm not actually playing my guitar with them. Excellent. Great advice for our music students that are all participating in this. Um, let's see. Uh, here is a question from Liz. Um, did your, did, what musical background did you come from? Were your parents and uh, any siblings into music? Like what, what made you start to love music as a young person? Good question. Um, no, none of my parents were musicians. I think my grandfather had an old, he was an old Italian man and had an old mandolin that eventually he passed on to me and it, it fell apart. It was old and all broken, but no, no parents were musicians. None of my family members uh, went to college. I was the first person in my family that went to college. Um, I was very involved in my church. And back in the 1970s, they used to have what's called folk mass days. So they have acoustic guitars and upright basses and tambourines. And in the old days of the churches, a lot of, you know, organ and, and, and choirs and this and that. So when the folk mass started back in the 70s, um, I got interested. I bought a guitar and I started playing with them. I just learned three chords, because basically that's all you had to do, play three chords. But it was like live TV. You had to keep up. So there were older people that were running it. But I was this youngster playing my three chords. And then eventually I would jam with, with different friends. And we would, we would just learn listening to albums because there was no YouTubes and none of these tutorials and stuff. So I um, did a lot with the ear, just learning by play by ear. Great. Uh, here's a very another very specific question. This is from a student named Aaron. <clears throat> and Aaron says that his father is a big fan of yours and his dad works at uh, Madison Square Garden or MSG Networks. And he wants to know if you have ever worked at Madison Square Garden. I have not worked at Madison wow. Square Garden. I have not. Um, his dad is a big fan of mine. Do, yes. the, do we... What's that? Does he know me or he just likes like what I do? I don't, I'm not sure because it's in this little block. It says his dad is a graphics designer for MSG networks and is a big fan of yours. Okay. Well, so maybe you've, I don't know, maybe you've crossed paths, but he's the, this young guy says his dad's a fan of yours. Well, if your dad knows me, tell him to email me, text me or private message me. Um, well, that's what you said earlier. Is is there a, a community of friends that you know different people? So I could have crossed paths with his dad, and now he's freelancing at MSM, uh, MS, uh, Madison Square Garden. Um, no, I never worked there. Uh, I never worked as a Broadway stage manager, but a lot of Broadway shows, a lot of concert bands that appeared um, at Madison Square Garden or Lincoln Center or the Opera or Broadway would come on a set of GMA. Mm -hmm. So I would work with them. But I never it, I never did a concert at, at the Garden and I never did um, Broadway. Okay. Fair enough. Let's see. Let's get to my third page here. 
Uh, okay, this is a really interesting one. Uh, pardon my pronunciation to the student of their first name. I hope I get it right. Uh, is it Zadrian? It, it might be. I, if it's not, I apologize. Um, but this student wants to know, what has been the most stressful day of your career at Good Morning America? 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the studio when 9-11 happened. And we were doing a normal show, and then the first plane hit, and one of our reporters lives down there, like right across, and he saw, and he called up on the phone, and we went automatically into special report mode, you know? A lot of times, special reports, you go uptown to, you know, the main anchor or something. We became special report, and just that whole day was was, was unreal, and it was it was very hard to to work that a lot of our first response a lot of our police officers who work good morning america who are like our security um they just rushed down there and they became you know first responders and and the horror stories that they experienced and saw and we were on the air live for hours and my wife's trying to call me and she's frightened because you know um and eventually i got out of the studio but but the normal roads that we would go, the police closed everything off. So I had to go way north of my house over what's called the Bear Mountain Bridge and come back around um, to get home. So that that was kind of the, the hardest day of my career. Mm -hmm. Wow. That must have been unbelievable mm -hmm. um, to be because you had to keep doing your job. <laughs> You had to you had to make sure everything was flowing, but then there was the other side of you that's like, is my family okay? Or the people I love okay, et cetera, sure. et cetera. Yeah, it must have been sure. Sure. terrible. Um now on the other uh end of that, Zadrian has this question. What do you do in your spare time? Ah. So I am married. I have four kids, uh, ranging 13 all the way to 29. So I'm a family person. Um, one of the reasons why I stayed at Good Morning America is so I can be a family person. Um, if you could see, let's say this is kind of the ladder of success. Okay, the bottom down here, here's the top. Stage manager, somewhere TV-wise, is somewhere in the middle, right? I met a lot of people down here that are just starting out, interns, assistants, that are up here now. Top producers, directors, VPs, presidents, talent. But I decided to stay where I am because I'm a family person. I get to go home. I do my job. I do it well. And I'm done at 11 o'clock and I go home. So I could be there to pick up my kids. I could be there for all the different games, all the different performances. Um, so that was a decision that I made. Um, what was what was the other part of the question? Did I answer it all? or No, it was a spare time. So it's, so it's So family time. I'm also a musician, right? Um, I'm a church musician. I play at churches. I have a ministry, as you could see, Friends in the Spirit 111 on Facebook. So I do a lot of this kind of a spiritual type thing. So I spend a lot of time with that. Um, so music, faith, family, right? Those are the three things, you know. I used to go to the gym. Now I'm not going to the gym anymore with, with this virus going on. But I take walks and stuff. So that's, that's my free time. Great. Uh, let's see. Have you? And I like to eat. I'm Italian. I like to eat. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, um, have you ever been brought up on stage with a celebrity? Yeah, many times. Go on my Facebook page, Eddie Luisi. You'll see pictures of me with different celebrities. Um, uh, you, you, Jackman, right? You, mm -hmm. Jackman, right? He in a lot of different movies, and I guess. He was in a, a Wolverine or something. Yeah. So we'll, uh, Hugh Jackman was coming on the set. At the time, Diane Sawyer, Robin Roberts were the host. And before the show, Diane's saying, you know, he's in great shape. I'm going to ask him to lift up his shirt so I can see his muscles. So now I go downstairs and and I go outside. I'm waiting for you. And, and when he comes off the street, he knows me because he's been on the show a few times. I said, hey, man. I said, Diane's going to ask you to lift your shirt to, he said, thanks, thanks, mate. You know, I don't know where is he from, Australia, where he's yeah, from. Yeah, yeah. Hey, thanks, mate. So he gets on the set, and they're live, live TV, and they're chit-chatting, and Diane asks him. And he goes, 
Eddie, you come over here. You show them your muscles. And then I go behind him and I lift up my 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 hoodie, but I didn't show because I don't have a six pack. But I go like this and I go like that and I start posting. So yes, I was on live TV many, many times. But that was one story that was kind of fun. Great story. Um, this student wants to know. This is Daniel, student Daniel. Daniel. Um you have many roles uh, in your bio and you've talked about your many different facets in your career. Um, do any of your jobs, um, do you prefer any of them over any others, like producing, composing, being a stage manager? Um, so most of those jobs happened at different times in my life. I'm not kind of doing them all at once right now. Oh, excuse me. Producing was cool years and years ago, um, but, uh, Sometimes as a stage manager, okay, because we have some young producers that come on the show right out of college. So there are some times that you are producing and you are stage managing and you are, you know, directing certain different things. Um, I, I love being a stage manager. I love working at Good Morning America. I love working with entertainment and, and music and, and comedians and actors and actresses. Um, directing, I, I used to direct a few shows. Um, but Good Morning America, like I said earlier, is 14 cameras and all these monitors and your head's down on scripts and roll this and roll that and take this. That's not enjoyable. If I were to get back into TV directing, I want to just look at the set. I want to look at monitors and I want to just cut it that way. I don't want my head in a script. Mm -hmm. um, composing wise, I did have a production company called Joe Ed Music where we did um, composed music and I got it on, on TV. I became an ASCAP composer and publisher. That was kind of fun, but it was also a lot of work and I finished GMA and then I would hop in my car and I'd go to my friend's studio basement and then would work to five o'clock. So I was working 12 hour days. By the time I got home, I was exhausted. I, I was useless to my family. And so it's like, I got into Good Morning America to work less hours and now I'm adding the music and I'm working 12 hour days to do this. And to this day, maybe Sean, maybe you could help me, Sean, but to this day, I still have all these ideas in my head and I have little clips of, of music all over the place, but I don't have anything digitally recorded and really well. And all the projects I've done, if you look on SoundCloud, I think I have some stuff. I always worked with somebody else. So somebody else was at Pro Tools or somebody else was mixing this or recording this. And everything that was in this head Nothing to this day has come on tape or digital the way I hear it. So I, I think even at the age of 60, I have to learn something technical here, input it myself so I get my sound the way I want it. And then if I could learn to mix it great or if I could send it to a friend that's a real good mixer, but at least I get it initially into the computer the way I hear it in my head. Right. That'd be a great thing to do. Um Let's see. Now, this is interesting. This is a student uh, named Owen that has this question and wants to know what it was like to work with David Letterman. David Letterman. So I worked on that show and David Letterman is a, a real professional, serious type guy. Um, and the David Letterman band, they're like absolutely fabulous. And in between the commercials, they just kick in and they just play for a long time. But very professional, very um, very smart man. I didn't have a lot of one-to-one -one interaction because when you go into another show that's not yours, you're not the main stage manager. So if there's two or three stage managers, they're dealing with the band, they're dealing with David, they're dealing with the talent. I'm kind of in the background supporting them. So okay. I didn't have a great rapport with him. Okay. Awesome. But good guy. Good guy. And his band, man, Will Lee, forget it. That guy, <laughs> unbelievable. He's pretty good. Oh, yeah, he's not too bad, right? <laughs> um, let's see. Um, my last page of questions, Eddie, so let me uh, filter these here real quick. Okay. Okay, this is a question from Chris. Now, it's specifically geared towards musicians, but maybe you could uh, – elaborate on this the question says how do you, when you're working with musicians on live tv how do you prepare them for like hard stops for a commercial and things like that how do you make sure that they flow into the commercial correctly wow that's a really good question yeah, yeah. um normally we don't give them out cues going into commercial we give them out cues if we want to do live bumpers so let me explain that 
So you're watching a TV show, you're in a commercial. Now we fade up out of the commercial onto the set and the band's playing, right? So I have to cue them out of the commercial. Five, four, three, cue them. If they have Pro Tools, I have to listen to the cue. I cue the Pro Tool person and hear how long the beat it, uh, how long the lag is before the music comes up. So I have to back time. So if the Pro Tools is a four second count, on my five, four, cue the Pro Tools, and then it fades up. Now, a lot of times at Good Morning America, we don't do this often, but in the old days, we used to always do live bumpers, and they wanted it to be 15 seconds or 20 seconds. Many times the bands will come in, and they're not used to doing TV, so they do the chorus of something, and it's 33 seconds, or it's 27 seconds, and the producer looks at me and says, it's too long, we can't do it. So as a musician now, okay, so now I'll say, hey, why don't you cut the intro? Why don't you cut four bars here? Or why don't on this up chord, you know, just end on that chord and don't take it out, this and that. And they listen to me and they try it and we time it and we nail it for 15 or 20 seconds. So that's how we get to hard time. Then there are certain times that, you know, maybe we're, we're doing a wedding segment and we have a string quartet playing. And then when when the, the host starts talking, we want them to fade out. So I'll work out at hand cue where I'll say, look at me, whoever the music director is, look at me, play, play, play. I keep on play, play, play. And then I'll like bring them down, bring it down, bring it down. And sometimes we bring it all the way down to the floor and I'll go my hands all the way to the floor to stop it. Or we'll just bring it down half level. But all this is in discussion beforehand because we have rehearsals, we have sound checks. And I have a rundown. I say, we're doing this song. We're doing this song. This has to be this amount, this amount. But when they do their full song, and after we rehearse it and time it, that's what they do live. So for some reason, the control room messes up and they run out of time. A lot of times, music gets chopped. And that has nothing to do with me. That's the control room just running out of time for some reason. Yeah, it's really interesting how uh, worlds uh, collided for you uh, because you're a musician and you're doing the stage managing managing job. And I remember when I was up there uh, performing with the Philadelphia Boys Choir, yep. um, you were asking me you were asking me musical questions as a musician. Right. Um, and instantly it gave. I'm like, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about. I love <laughs> this guy. You know. And I, I I've talked to other musicians that have worked with you on the show, and they all said the same thing. Uh, because it was, you know, you were talking musically to them, like four measures, this, that, you know, right. not ambiguous terms, right. but I think the very direct terms that you're using really uh, make you do what you do uh, so well. Thanks. And okay. what I like to do also when I meet different talent, especially musicians, you could tell if you're going to hit it off or not. A lot of times they're rehearsing before I get to the set and I'll joke around, you know, you know, Where's the Pro Tools? So this and that. Like, I know there's no Pro Tools. Like, it's a jazz band, and I know they're live. And, you know, and I'll just kind of joke with them, like, with no Pro Tools? How can we do live TV without Pro Tools? So there's different ways I kind of joke with different people, where I'll pick one person, like the drummer, and I'll tease the drummer, or I'll tease this person, and then the whole band kind of gangs up, and it kind of makes it a little lighter, for especially bands that have never been on live TV. Type, so you know, live TV. Questions. Real quick here. Let's see. Okay, so I have uh, one more question from, oh, this is actually no student. Um, they said, who do you think, uh, now this is such a tough question, who's the most talented person you've had the privilege of working with? Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there are tons and tons and tons. And I could say Sean Kennedy and then I get an attaboy. Um, yeah, right. Um, there's a person by the name of Nathan East. Have you heard of Nathan oh. East? Yeah. Nathan East is a very, very, very famous bass player, has been playing for 40 years. He plays on almost every single album there is. One time I walk into the studio and I got my back to the band, right? And I hear this bass and I said, wow, this is the best bass I ever heard in my life. I turn around and I see this guy playing the bass with this big smile. And I go, Nathan East. And because I know him from playing with Eric Clapton and, and you know, tons of other people. So we go over and we start chit-chatting and stuff and very humble guy, really great guy, got this great groove and he was there with Babyface at the time and it was a full band, like a 10-piece band, all session players. And um, so I, I think I said earlier, I don't know if you guys heard it or not, I like to tease different people. I like to, as a, as a stage manager, I like to develop a rapport. So he's there playing a, a, 
a Yamaha base, but it's a Nathan East model. So I said, oh, big shot. You got your own Nathan East model. And he just laughs and puts his head down. We finished the rehearsal, right? The whole band comes, they leave. He leaves his guitar in the stand. I get a piece of scotch tape and I put a long piece of scotch tape on the body of his guitar. And with a Sharpie, I sign my name, Eddie Luisi. An hour and a half later, right? They have their coffee, their breakfast. They come to the set. He walks and like 20 feet away, he sees scribbling on his face and he's like ready to kill he's like so angry he walks up he sees scotch tape and he sees my name and i said now your base is worth money <laughs> <laughs> that's outstanding <laughs> and then like the next month he was in bass player magazine he's on the cover and he sent me a copy he mailed me a copy and then he put a piece of scotch tape and signed my name on it <laughs> oh that's beautiful <laughs> yeah he is a monster player yeah, he's pretty darn good. <laughs> so I have one more question, and I know you wanted to leave the kids with some advice, but here's my last. This is from me. Um, years ago, we talked about when you were on the set, when Elmo, Elmo made his debut. And to go along with that, I just watched the Carol Spinney um, documentary. Okay. And I was, you know, I, I grew up in the 70s. Um, Big Bird, Oscar the Grouch, they were part of my life. Um, I, I looked at your whole bio. <laughs> what was it like to work with Big Bird and Oscar the Grouch? <laughs> right. So I, I worked with them first when they came to the sets of Good Morning America. And then I, I met one of the stagehands who also worked at Sesame Street. So he got me a gig at Sesame Street. So I actually worked at Sesame Street many, many episodes. I wasn't the main guy. I was like a backup. But I was right there on the set. It was unbelievable. It was fabulous. It was magical. Um so much talent, you know, you, you, you see the, the funness and stuff, but you know, all these puppeteers and, and Muppet people, you know, if there's six or seven Muppets on the set, they're all laying on the floor and they're all on top of each other and then they got their arms up and, and, and it's crazy. And, and then they have, they have pads behind them and they have little monitors in between their legs. So they're looking at a monitor while their hand is up and, and they're, wow. Walking and, and then they have scripts. Sometimes they don't have scripts. Um, but Jim Henson and, and, you know, the original Kermit the Frog and Kevin, I forget Kevin's name, was the original Elmo and Big Bird, Carol Spinney. I worked with all of them. And just wonderful, calm, down-to-earth, talented, kind people, just fabulous people. So really a lot of fun, very exciting to, to work with them. Was Frank Oz on the set when you worked there too? Frank Oz was not on the set when I was there because he's what Miss Piggy, and that's yeah. the Mozzie Bear Yoda. All yeah, but you know what? I met Frank Oz with um, Jim Henson on the set of GMA. They wow. were the original Kermit the Frog and Miss Piggy. When I went to Sesame Street, I'm not sure if he was there. I think that was he already retired that that, and then you know went on to other people doing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. Yeah. Well, Eddie, um, I know you wanted to wrap up with some advice for the kids. Um, so I just wanted to thank you. Uh, I think this was a lot of fun and I hope all the kids get something out of it. So uh, why don't you leave them with your um, parting words of advice? Okay. So I already said at this stage of your life, yes, yes, yes. Right. And in your career, yes, yes, yes. I'm also a dad. So morally, you know, the word no exists, but career wise, you want to say yes. You want to, um, I see a lot of resumes, a lot of people send me resumes, a lot of people are contacting me with Facebook and emails and texts. And you could, you could take one class in TV production in high school or college, and you could say, I'm a director, I'm a producer, I'm a camera person, I do lighting, I do audio, I do that. Yeah, take TV 101 and you learn all that stuff. Tell me what's the extra things that you do. What's the things that you do outside of the class that makes you stand out? What do you do on the weekends? Where do you volunteer? Where do you do extra stuff? You know, if you're a videotape, you want to be a camera person, well, show me your videos. Where are your videos? If you're a musician, where are you playing? Even if you're young and you can't get paid, are you volunteering? If you're a songwriter or composer, let me see. Are you doing this on a daily basis? So I want to see all the extra stuff that you're doing, volunteer type work. Um, so that's good advice, right? Volunteer, extra work, saying yes to different opportunities, 
remember. Oh, so my last word of advice. Okay. Um, so right now you're young, right? You guys are still in school and, and you're saying yes. So now, you know, at, once you get your first job, if you want to work the 60, 70, 80 hours, that's cool, right? You want to just hustle and you want to get the opportunity to make the money. That's good. But down the road, okay, and, and and hopefully you could you could keep this somewhere in your brain, or maybe there's teachers or parents that are watching this. When you're 30, 35, 40, right? Do you want to be married? Do you want to be single? Do you want to have kids? Do you not want to have kids? Do you want to live in a house? Do you want to live in an apartment? Do you want to live in the suburbs? Do you want to live in the city? These are all things that are part of your life also. And think about them. Because working in live TV, network TV, I met a lot of women that worked, 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 worked until they were 40 and they never met somebody and they didn't get married. Or they got married and worked, 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 worked and didn't have kids and then they hit 40 something. They said, well, I don't want to have kids. I'm too late. I'm too old for that. And I'm not judging. I'm not a judgmental person. I'm observing. This is what I've observed. So hustle now. And if you want to just not get married and not have kids and just work, 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 and God bless you, do it. But if you do want to get married and you do want to have kids, you want to have a house, you want to this and that, think of that. Put that somewhere in the back of your mind. Work your job, work different jobs, freelance, save up your money so you could go on that path also later on in life. Great, great words of advice, Eddie. Thanks. Well um, it was great connecting with you this way, even though we couldn't be in person, we kind of are in person virtually. Yep. And, um, you know, I hope, uh, you and your family are doing well with this crisis up in New York. And yep. I look forward to the day that you and I can actually be together again in person and, uh, hang out a little bit. That would be great. That would be great. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Eddie. You're welcome. All right. See ya. See ya. If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to check out the helpful links in the description below from many of my partner companies. Especially check out the link to One Beat Better. One Beat Better is offering a limited time free portable practice pad called the Presto Pad to any viewers of this interview. If you use the code SJKDRUMS at checkout, the pad will be free. You'll just have to pay for shipping. So go over to One Beat Better and check out the Presto Pad.